Thank you very much, Marco, and thank you, uh, Rector, and uh, my other friend, Marco, Diane, and everybody here for coming. I'd like to tell you a bit about what I do, and mainly about a project that uh, I'm engaged with. Um, so I'm honour-bound to tell you about the project, but I would also prefer to tell you about my research as well. Some of that will come um, after dinner with some people, but if not, I'm hoping I'll enthuse you to look at uh, what we're doing to, so that you can see the actual research. Most, if not all, of the research that I've ever done has been multidisciplinary, and therefore I think it's perfect place that I should be here because I know the centre here that you're forming uh, is aimed at being interdisciplinary and uh, have an experience of trying to get that going, and in particularly more recently in the art domain, which is not necessarily what mathematicians normally do. Anyway, let me tell you first, though, something about the project Future ICT, which is a project that I'm the coordinator for to the European Commission. It's a very large-scale project. We have about 1,000 groups have signed up to us, and uh, it's certainly engaging all of my time and many of the time, much of the time of many people around uh, Europe. Um, it's scientifically led by Dirk Helbing in ETH in Zurich, and I coordinate with the, the Commission and with people around the country. So, um, because you're probably not familiar with uh, funding around uh, the European Commission, let me try and tell you something about that. I'll try and give you some of the background details of the project, but I'll also tell you something about the modelling that I would intend to do if uh, I can get going, and that I would try and do... Uh, modeling so that we can actually model the present so that we can protect our future. So I'm really thinking about sustainability long term. <clears throat> so firstly, the, the project is going for something called a FET flagship. So FET stands for Future and Emerging Technologies. It's this kind of wacky research end of the European Commission. So um, at the moment, it, under FP7, it sits um, in the, the DGs. So these are all the DGs of the European Commission. So for instance, this is the uh, research element. So there's one on energy, for instance, one on climate action. But there is one called DG IMSO, which stands for Information Society and Media. But as soon as you go into that website, the IMSO becomes ICT challenges. That itself is split up into several areas one of which happens to be e-governance, um, which I also would like to try and work with. But FET is this future and emerging technologies, um, which is split into two. The only reason I tell you this is if you're actually interested in the funding, it's a very complicated process. And you have to realize that all these teams here are rather like departments in a university. They're all trying to claim they're the best, and they're all trying to get the bigger budget for next year. So each of them are trying to do that. Um, when FP7 finishes, which is at the end of 2014, and we go into the next funding range. So the FET flagships come out of FET Proactive. Okay, they decided to come together in roughly about 2009 uh, to fund flagships which, which would be large-scale, ambitious, science-driven initiatives that were really visionary research and that they tried to aim to have real scientific breakthrough. The idea is that it would require cooperation across Europe and it would be for a 10-year period, whereas normally um, FET programs and all European Commission programs are, two, are three to four years. Um, actually, I think this bit here is what got most people's attention, though. The fact is they want to aim at funding levels of 100 million euros per year. Um, this is almost unprecedented. There are a couple of European projects that do that. Future of the Internet is one. So this is a project on a scale we've never seen before. So basically they said to all the scientists around Europe, said, come up with ideas, tell us what we should do. If, if, if there's a big science, what should it be? You know, we have CERN. Um, what should be the next thing that Europe should be doing? So just to give you a bit of background, the timeline started in 2009, roughly. Where there was a first call for pilot studies in 2010. Each of the pilots got a year. So that what they did is they uh, decided they would have six pilots running for one year. So each of those pilots got 1.5 million, roughly, actually, 
Uh, our project got more than that. So it's um, quite a lot of money to spend in one year just to meet people and talk about the project. Um, but that's what I'm trying to do. And the idea is that they will choose somehow over the next year, and in 2013, 2014, they will choose two that go forward. So basically, they set up an X Factor competition um, to try and decide what should be the big science for the next uh, 10 years. So there are six projects that they are funding for the pilot phase. And I show you them here because it's important that you're aware of what's going on. So um, Future ICT is uh, the project that we're doing. And I have to say, um, when the ranking came to come down from 21 projects to six projects for the pilot phase, Future ICT was ranked highest. So I do think that we are the forerunners, but it doesn't mean to say we can sit back. Uh, the other projects are graphene, which is a new material, one la layer thick of atom, thick of carbon. Um, it's basically a material science project. Um, the Guardian Angels is about uh, zero power sensors, which can be used in a health domain. Uh, the human brain is trying to do large scale simulations of the, the human brain, needless to say. Future of the Medicine is using IT for medicine. And the robot one is talking about building robotic uh, sentient robots for companions for our life, particularly if we're older or we need help. So of these, uh, you can see these three have a health uh, aspect to it, which flavors some, things, some of the things what I say, because some of the work that could be done in our project could be very strongly linked to health, but um, which largely avoided to make us distinct from the other projects. Okay, so future ICT pro proposal first. I'll tell you a bit about um, why we're doing it, what we're going to do, um, and how we're going to do it, and what's going to be the benefits. Firstly, what is the step change for us is the big data. This has really changed our lives at the moment. There's a massive amount of data is now becoming available. So we're able to look at that data and do things we couldn't do before. We're looking for a big change in science, not a small change going from one project to another. So we all know how we can do that in our academic lives. We have one student looking at the project that was done before and they move it along a little bit. We're trying to do something that's fundamentally different. We want to actually make use of and um, understand the big data that is available. So at the moment, it's rather like a data deluge. There's a huge amount of data being collected. For instance, some of it is by Facebook and some of it is by Google. And we don't actually have control of that data. Um, I bet the younger people in this audience probably have Facebook. Do you? Is that right? All right. And you, know, you, you sign away your rights in order to be able to use it. But now they can use Facebook for face recognition for crowds, so using all the pictures that you've tagged. So if there is a crowd, like a demonstration outside, they can tell you automatically who's in that crowd based on the tagging that you have done through your Facebook. So, there's a whole lot of data out there which could be potentially useful, but also could be potentially dangerous as well. So we really need to understand the dangers as well as the benefits. So I really think there is a big challenge in this data. Um, all our mobile phones have sensors in them. It tells you where you are, but also it tells the mobile phone operators where you are. So all that data can be collected. I don't know what it's like here, but in, uh, in London we have an Oyster card, which is a cheaper mechanism to use the train and tube systems and bus systems, but it also means they can log exactly where I'm going and they can follow uh, my path and use that information to try and uh, make better services perhaps or in fact make better money for the companies as well. So it is a real challenge and there's a great opportunities that are available to us to try and understand how things are going. Um, so we believe also there is a challenge but there's opportunities. So there is actually, sometimes there is too much data, sometimes the speed of the data is such that it, um, things go wrong and what is certainly true, the systems that we're dealing with now are more complex than before and this sometimes leads to fa uh, problems or failures. 
So to think about why, let's think about the challenges that are around at the moment. These are just four examples of potential challenges that we all face, in fact. This one is actually taken from the American stock market, which shows a big dip just after 2008. It shows that actually the financial systems are connected in ways we probably did not understand when we set the systems up. And so therefore, trying to understand the connectivity and the outcomes that follows from that is an important aspect for us. This one here is the, fret, the spread of uh, like H1N1 flu epidemics. We now have transport systems which link us far greater than before, which means the capacity for the spreading of a disease is much more than it used to be. But this is not just physical diseases. This could be viruses in mobile phones, for instance. And we, we're now in a situation where that could spread incredibly quickly around the world. This shows a uh, picture taken for after the Fukushima event where an offshore earthquake uh, um, offshore of Japan caused a meltdown in the um, nuclear power. So these are all challenges to try and help us, that we need to do to try and help us understand the systems that we've designed. Certainly the banking and the internet systems are two systems that we actually created we manufactured the banking systems, you know, people designed the tools that actually caused the subprime mortgage collapse in the US. And yet what we didn't know at the time was how those systems would interact together. So although we've actually been looking at globalizing our systems for the last 30 years or something, we have not studied the, the, what happened, the science of those global systems. So the idea of the project is that we need to understand the science of these global systems. To try and illustrate some of that, the problems, um, one thing that happens is a cascade of failures. You see a, a small failure somewhere leads to a knock-on event elsewhere. It could be like the dominoes effect. The dominoes are very easy um, uh, game to try and show how it would happen, where one dominoes would fall over and knock the next one. Actually, this uh, doesn't look so dissimilar from a domino's effect. It's actually houses sliding into one another, which were built on an unstable piece of land. So actually, it's not so surprising, though. You can see if this one is too close to it, then if it fell over, it would fail. Well, actually, they should have seen this, and the civil engineers amongst us should have been able to tell them that that wasn't going to happen. But for some reason or other, they didn't. So a very simple, nice demonstration of this, because don't forget we're here thinking out of the box. Um, I try to show things like this. This is a YouTube clip of, in fact, 3,000 or something dominoes all lined up. It happens to be in the shape of the world, which is also uh, related to the logo of the Future ICT project. What happens is one perturbation somewhere causes a knock-on effect, which eventually travels around the whole world. This is exactly what we have seen in the financial crisis that we're currently in at the moment. Um, I don't think we're out of the, the woods yet by a long way. I think certainly countries like Greece, uh, Spain and Italy are in serious trouble. I'm really not sure about Slovenia, so um, I should try and understand that. What this shows, though, is a very clear example of how cascading effects can lead to uh, things that once we've thought about it, we probably could have stopped it if we'd wanted to. So, whoops, sorry, sorry, let me, let me just go on. Um, I'll skip forward too many there. Um, so, this was a, a, a simple cascade of events. But actually, sometimes things are not quite so simple. You can actually get events which uh, give you cascade of failures which uh, are not so simple to understand. And this is a, a, a clear example of that. So I just need to go forward to... Um. So this is another way I use, like to use illustration. And we were talking earlier uh, amongst ourselves about illustration. This is a, a cartoon taken from a magazine um, this chappie says here, I've got a really good stock uh, that could excel. And this one says, really, excel? And this one says, excel? 
But this person uh, misunderstands that and thinks it means sell. So then they start shouting, sell, 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 and everybody starts selling and the stock market crashes. Down here, somebody, they're still yelling, sell, but this one says, this is madness, I can't take any more. So his friend says, goodbye, goodbye. And then somebody hears this as, buy, maybe you should buy, buy, buy. So this shows you how sometimes it's a little surprising. We wouldn't have imagined that this would have happened. So sometimes things happen which are quite surprising, and we really need to understand these much, much better. So another YouTube clip which shows this um, places uh, table tennis balls, ping pong balls, on mouse traps, and it's been used in the physics literature for a, a fusion reactor or something. And it's a really nice example of how a small perturbation in one place leads to a knock-on effect somewhere else, which can eventually affect the whole system. So this uh, clip shows this. Uh, the mouse traps are set with a table tennis on board, and finally it affects the whole system. So if I just go back one, you'll see this. Let me just go back. Sorry. Uh, let me see if I can get it to go. This is that in a very large scale. It's been used for an advertising campaign. So they've put those mouse traps across a whole basketball court. Uh, this person is actually talking about innovation. He's saying that actually his company understands innovation, that innovation somewhere can spark off something else somewhere else. So this is a really interesting way of uh, trying to understand um, how systems work. This, this was an energy company, actually, but if you look at what happened in, uh, this is 2006, where we had blackouts across Europe in the energy grid systems. So we quite often see in our systems that we've created that um, we can have failures which give us quite surprising. So you think all oh, this connectivity is terrible and maybe we should stop being connected. And in fact, in the UK, from 2019, they've decided to actually separate retail banking from investment banking because they do not want the investment people who are making lots of money to suddenly crash the whole um, re uh, retail banking system. But actually, there's some good things about... Um, let me, go, let me have to go forward. There are some good things as well. So there's also good news. I don't know if you know, last year there were some riots in London. Actually, my students are studying the, the London riots. And in fact, the largest sentences, the biggest sentences given to people, and not the people who stole things from the shops, but were people who incited the riot, using Facebook and so on, saying, come on, let's meet up and go and break into a few shops. And in fact, somebody has been um, given a very long prison sentence, even though nobody ever turned up and nothing was ever broken. But people still feel that that is incitement to riot is the worst thing. But it's not all bad, though, because actually after the riots, a, a Twitter account and a Facebook account were set up that had 70,000 users with about, within about a few hours. And they all said, let's go and clean up the street. So the next morning, they all arrived with their brushes and their brooms, and they swept up the streets. So somehow, this collective behavior and connectivity can be really good. And the idea of the project is that we want to enhance this participation and collective behavior. So this is a street map thing. You probably all use Google, but there is a, actually a free editable map called uh, OpenStreetMap. It was started by a UCL graduate, actually, um, postgraduate, I think. And it's actually made up by people like you contributing your pictures uh, and creating a map in a free editable way without anybody taking uh, any information from you. There are also ways that you can now reconstruct uh, images, 3D images of buildings. So I've seen one of the Colosseum in Rome, which is taken by thousands of people offering up their, their photos from Flickr and so on. And by having thousands of people and knowing exactly where they stood to take that photograph, you could do a perfectly good 3D reconstruction that you can move around and have a virtual image of the object people were looking at based on this collaborative behavior. 
Of course, we all know Wikipedia is an idea of collaborative behavior, but also in the US they have people contributing to a kind of a citizen science where people in their homes are having sensors in their mobile phones to understand about seismic behavior. So some more good news is that we can actually use that information to both design and manage systems better. So my colleague Dirk Helbing was involved in this one. This is a bridge called the Jamarat Bridge in Saudi Arabia. And every year, thousands of people, millions of people go, to, go across this bridge. And typically each year it led to deaths when people were crushed. So understanding of how people move and how the dynamics of people interact enabled them to come up with a new design for a bridge which would minimize the chances of people losing their lives. In terms of managing their lives, this is actually a picture of the NASA Space Center where you can see all the technology is brought into place to try and manage a particular, in that case, a one-off event. But there's no reason why it can't happen elsewhere. This is actually taken in Napier University. They have a multi-touch table with things on the screens, on the wall, and on the table. And if you want to look at data, you can th literally take it off the table, throw it at the wall, and it goes on the wall. This is a way of visualizing and interacting with the data to help us understand it better so that we can actually bring it down to mobile phone size eventually without losing functionality. So all the information that is available to NASA here will soon become available almost at this level here. So it's a matter of saying, how could we use that? We could use it in a university setting, for instance. The rector could use it for deciding where he should be spending money, which is the critical places for making repairs to buildings. You could use it in crisis management if the river down here decided to flood. How would you best do that? You could actually have all that information coming together. So this is really what the idea of Future ICT is about. It's a coming together of really three core areas. It's coming together of ICT, information communication technology. It's coming together of social sciences and coming together of what we call complexity sciences. In other words, the science of connected systems. Now, we're not doing it alone. Actually, for some time already, ICT is already becoming more social. That's why you have Facebook and Twitter. So ICT is becoming more social. We also see social scientists are becoming more computational. There are many more social scientists who now do quantitative social science. And indeed, there are now more people doing complexity science to understand the science of globally connected systems. So it's this that brings us together. We feel this is the key time now to bring this emergence of these three groups together, plus the big data, to make sure that we can actually do something tangibly good with that uh, information in a very um, uh, way that leads to sustainability and participation by everybody. So we think that will actually do two things um, predominantly. It's going to actually give us new science to explore and understand the systems that we're living in at the moment, but also it should enable us to develop new technology as well, which is socially adaptive and socially aware. So for instance, I know somebody who's working on a haggle system for mobile phones, and instead of using uh, Google, which actually I'm told uh, when you do one Google search sets off a thousand servers and gives you six million uh, inf bits of information you could use, whereas for very zero, almost zero power, you could actually ask the people in the room here, and you get that almost for free. So if we could have our mobile phones doing that for free, then this means that the power consumption is, is much lower. You might be interested to know in Italy, I don't know about in Slovenia, but in Italy, the largest user of electricity is the, uh, is the railways, but the second largest user is the telecoms. So we've invented the telecom systems to actually make our lives better or more interesting, and it's using massive amount of power. So actually this haggle system for trying to understand lower power technologies is not such a daft idea. So what are we going to do? We're going to bring these three fields together to try and help us to, to do things in a more resilient manner. It started really from the groups in London around myself, but also the ETH in Zurich where Dirk Helbing is. But we can't do it alone. It has to require a network of people. So actually we have hubs in most countries now 
Um, so each, most of the bigger countries have a hub set up, a network of people coming together to study problems like this. But in addition, we have links to other groups around in the US and indeed to uh, China and Australia so that we actually find it's a really a, is a globally connected network. So what we'll try and do then is bring these three things together, complex systems, ICT and social science. So the three colors in the diagrams link up with that. We're actually going to do, um, try and combine three elements as well, models, data and people. So these are our core models, uh, core issues really. The models will allow us to explore what if scenarios, what if I did this, what if the price of electricity was more, what if we did a higher taxation. We would be able to explore those situations much better. The data tells us what is the state of the system. It measures the system using fixed data and mobile data. So there are a lot of mobile data sources. For instance, Twitter is commonly available. We can get Twitter data, um, but also some static data like sensors or government data. Uh, I don't know about in Slovenia, but in the UK, we have this open government data where huge amounts of government data is being uh, handed out free. But also we want people to interact. So um, what for is the, the nice way of putting it, but so what is the colloquial way of doing it? So what are we going to do? We need people to interact with that. So the whole idea is when we do that, the models can explore our what-if scenario. The data explores the what is and the people bit allows people, people to engage with that. Now then, what we need to do though is do this on a very big scale because we've been doing this for some time. Now the idea is if we actually look at the data for instance and take data not just from your mobile phone but from everybody, everybody's mobile phone, all the smart energy meters that are around and the transport systems and if this is done globally then this becomes a planetary nervous system. It tells us the state of our systems. If we allow people, politicians and businesses to inter interact, it becomes a global participatory platform. While if the models range from an individual person walking on the street to a city scale and indeed looks at global uh, money exchange, it becomes a living earth simulator. So all these together provide a platform which is what we should be doing. We're not going to just do a... Um, do it in a broad sense though, we need to actually choose particular areas. So for instance, in the area of crime, um, there is a lot of work going on, indeed my two PhD students look at crime modeling, and uh, we need to get the expertise of that. So this will be perhaps centered in a physical location, this is deliberately centered over Italy because uh, that's where my collaborator is who does crime, but it would connect to other people outside as well. So the idea is that in each of those places, we call them observatories because they're observing in a specific topic area. But the point is that in order to be able to combine with other people, they need to take in the data sources but actually have an understanding also of policy, how their results might be used, of ethics. They need to understand the ICT components as well. So that when they do that, this can all link into our full system. So the idea is that the areas that we'll be studying will be quite broad. So in the areas of the economy, we should have things about financial models, economics, whereas in society, we should have ideas about demography, we should have conflict, war, crime. And in environment, for instance, we should do something on food and water and uh, climate change issues. So we need experts from all of these areas to come together. So actually, if we build this living earth simulator, we think it'd be really good to integrate all existing things, but do them at a scale that has never been done before. So not only the data will be at a bigger scale, the models will be a much bigger scale than before and at increased detail that we've not been able to do up until now. So the benefits, if we can do that, we can combine these things together. We can actually enhance our lives. So the idea is that if we, so there's two aspects to what we call the innovation accelerator. One is with all this knowledge, we should be able to combine it all together to really understand how we can develop new ideas 
So it becomes an innovation accelerator because we have so much knowledge. So let me just skip over this one. Um, but actually, um, to try and understand first what innovation is, we should first understand what it is not. So firstly, innovation is not a pipeline. If you really want to understand innovation, you do not just put money in at one end and out comes innovation at the other end. Innovation is all about having an ecosystem of people and things coming together. <coughs> it's a very complicated model, and all these things have a, a names alongside them. And this is actually an energy ecosystem. It's thinking about all the things that need to be put in place before somehow, serendipitously sometimes, innovation comes out of here. So rather like those mouse, balls, uh, mouse traps earlier on and the ping pong balls, we need to understand how we can actually do this to create further innovation. We also understand that innovation really requires a platform. Amazon started out as a bookseller, but now it's a platform for many businesses to do business off their platform. So this is why we need to create a future ICT platform to allow lots of people to engage with that, to actually build from it. So we're not going to j just do uh, um, science. We also have to think how our project would fit in with the world. So for instance, ethics must be a critical part of what we do. We have to think about the ethical components at the beginning as an integral part of the work, rather than do what they do now, uh, do what Facebook did when they started, just do it and don't worry about the ethics until afterwards, until people start shouting. We also need to understand the interaction with science and the arts because we're really interested in social well-being in the broader sense. We need to think about um, how we link with policy and how we link with business as well. So the idea is that we, it takes that this holistic approach, which is not too dissimilar from what you're trying to do with your multidisciplinary work here. So if we do that, we think that we'll actually get three types of outcomes. There will be, for policy, it will enable us to actually manage those global systems much better than before. So we will have benefits for policy. For science, it's going to improve our understanding of how our social systems work. So social and economic systems, this is, and how they interact with technology and the economic systems. For technology, it will inspire this new technology and products from this platform to encourage collective awareness and wider participation than we currently have. So this is our coming together of our three groups. So what do I quite mean by that? Um, actually, a lot of the time I think about this idea of modeling the present to protect the future. Um, certainly, uh, I think a great example it, uh, that we will need to show is in this policy domain, what I call a policy wind tunnel, to allow policy makers to test their ideas before they try them out on us, the public. So this might be something like tax rises or fuel increase charges or something. Um, but it also will enable us to understand the connections that are around and also the strength and feedbacks that occur. I also want to be able to do it in a management setting. I think almost all of us would like to have this information available. That might take 10 years, but um, we could start by actually getting some of that information which is available to large companies now, but start having it available to people. So the idea is that we will have better debating platforms and argument maps so that we can actually understand what's going on in the world. We can actually build up a sort of an app store almost of models and data so that people can put their models and plug them in and data and try and test them in this global setting with other works going on. We should be able to develop this idea of interactive virtual worlds where we can test things out in the computer, in silico, rather than doing it in the public in general. And what's more, for things like energy systems, where now we're becoming not just consumers or producers, we used to have producers, the electricity companies, and us, the consumers, 
with now um, with wind and uh, solar power, we have this idea that sometimes I might produce energy and sometimes I might consume it. So we have this prosumer idea. So we have to understand what balance that gives us in order to protect the system, the overall system, so we don't have the failures that we saw earlier. So all of this is really the project that we're discussing, the future ICT it's called. Um, so we think now is the time to actually combine those elements together. So this was a, a first video we did a long time ago to try and show how the data is really the critical thing and how if we bring all that data to power, um, to bear on some really serious problems, we can actually make a difference. So I'd encourage you to have a look at the website, it's uh, Future ICT, and I'll be happy to, to answer any questions later on the, on the project itself. All right.